Good afternoon and good morning to some of you. Thanks for joining us in our uh, four-part series here, How to Build a Value-Driven PMO. Uh, my name is Tim Conroy. I'm SVP of uh, the Americas for Cyforma. I'm going to introduce in a second Dan Berenger, who will be our uh, who will be our speaker for today. Uh, just before we get started, want to hit a couple of things. Uh, as you may have seen when you came in, this session is being recorded. And so everyone will receive the recording once the session is complete. And so you can have that share it in your organization uh, or rewatch as you uh, as you see fit. If someone in your organization signed up and didn't attend or can't attend, uh, they will also receive the recording as well. So that should be good. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Down at the bottom of your screen, there's the three dots. If you click that and go to the Q&A section, you can put questions in there. And then at the end, I'll read them to Dan. I'll be monitoring throughout the session. And then we'll, we'll read them off to Dan and uh, and he can answer uh, as we go through the Q&A session. So put your questions in there if you would. We'll hand them at the end. Everybody's on mute right now, except for Dan and I. So, um, you know, you, you won't be able to speak, but uh, you can you can put the question in the Q&A. Um, lastly, just to review the session. So today we're going to talk about building a value driven PMO. Uh, net two weeks from now is the second session, tailoring your projects for value delivery. That'll be the September 8th session, same time. The third one is governance and controls in a value driven PMO. That's Thursday, September 22nd, uh, also 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 o'clock Eastern. And then the last one is to tie back together with Cyforma and how we power uh, the value-driven PMO that we've discussed in the previous three sessions. That's uh, uh, That webinar is Thursday, October 6th. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for the entire series and that you'll, uh, you'll get a lot of information, a lot of good insight uh, throughout the process as we go. Um, and again, they'll all be recorded. So if you're not able to make one or two of them in the middle there, uh, you will be able to get the recording and, and stay in touch with us uh, as we progress through the series. So uh, with that said, I'll introduce Dan just briefly and I'll let him go further into his background. But uh, Dan Berenger is with Projects by Design, our good friend and partner. And uh, Dan's been in the program and uh, project management space for 22 plus years uh, with a with a great track record of uh, of delivery across the board. Um, he's a certified trainer in the uh, PMP space, a certified associate in project management, a disciplined agile scrum master, senior scrum master, um, and does a whole lot of training in the PMI world. Uh, so we're we're very blessed to have and happy to have Dan with us today and throughout this webinar series to uh, to step us through this process. So with that, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, you can take it from here. I'll be uh, monitoring questions, as I said, and if uh, if anything comes up, Dan, in the middle, just holler at me if you need anything and take it away. Very good. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate this opportunity to share with everyone some of the things that we're seeing in the project management space. Um, we came in contact with Cypharma through one of our clients who had asked us to help out with an RFP uh, on a new pro project portfolio management system. Um, as we went through that RFP, and I got a little bit more into insight into some of the different systems, there was a uniqueness with Cypharma that really intrigued me. Uh, that uniqueness was that it was adaptive to the way that you choose to work. Um, I have not seen that as much within other uh, project portfolio management tools. So we just carried the conversation on after that uh, to just try to uh, see how we might collaborate in the future. And the reason for that is there is the, a new thing called, well, maybe not so new, but maybe new within the project management space, which is this idea that we're going to look for how we can add value as opposed to add process. Now, 
as you have seen, uh, it can see here as well as uh, heard from Tim on my experiences, we've had a, a vast um, you know, experience across multiple industries, multiple project types and things of that nature. But one of the things that I've always attempted to do as a project manager is bring in new ideas and innovate on how to deliver more efficiently and effectively for the customer. Uh, to that end, going all the way back to 2004, I ran a scrum within a waterfall traditional governed PMO and was almost run out of town, right? <laughs> it's like, you can't do that here. Uh, we did, and we did it successfully. So we'll talk a little bit about that experience and how that went, as well as um, how PMOs can be more adaptive in order to ensure that the value is being uh, created for the customer. Um, as a matter of fact, within PMI in version seven of the project management body of knowledge, the guide to the project management body of knowledge, it there is a lot of discussion of value stream and value management and those sorts of things. We're going to talk a lot about that and how you as a PMO can prove your value through using these sorts of things. So to understand that, we're going to first talk about what is the gymnastic enterprise, as PMI would say, then conceptually look at what is the need for adaptability? Why is it so important for us to adapt? We'll look at the value equation and the new value triangle, um, as, as it were. We're going to then transition or leap, if you will, to strategy and how project organizations are currently typically set up. Um, and then based upon the value stream, how the PMO of the future might be set up, some of which uh, you probably already have uh, undergone some transformation as a PMO. And most importantly, moving from prescriptive practices to being able to apply patterns of delivery within your organization, and then close that out with how that actually looks within the PMO of the future. So with that, let's move on to the gymnastic enterprise. Uh, every year, PMI does a survey that's called the Pulse of the Profession, where we look at project management in the enterprise and what's making it work, what are the trends, and those sorts of things. In the 2021 survey, they describe the emergence of the gymnastic enterprise. The gymnastic enterprise is able to flex and pivot in order to meet the demands that come their way. This has huge implications to your PMO. As your PMO able to flex and pivot, depending on the situation, in order to meet your customer needs. In other words, gymnastic enterprises focus more on outcomes than on process. Selecting the very best ways of working from a landscape of possibilities. Now, one of the things I do hear very often as someone who's very close to PMI, I've been a member since 2001, uh, uh, as in, in project management, even before that, I hear, well, you know, I don't like the way that PMI says you need to do projects. Okay. Well, ironically, PMI has, hasn't said all the way since I think PMBOK 2, version 2, which is uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, even in PMBOK 2, they said there is no one prescriptive way that every project should be run. Yet it has always been kind of known as the waterfall or the traditional different way, the proponent within that, the, you know, the 49 uh, processes and the five process groups and the 10 knowledge areas and those sorts of things. And PMI definitely is shifting away from that. Not that they're shifting away from the processes, but they're shifting away from the idea that that set of processes are all that a project manager needs to know in order to effectively manage a project. Instead, we're shifting to broaden the toolkit and use all the different things available to you uh, for that. So as we move on and we look at the gymnastic enterprise in terms of the uh, responses, we found that 68% of businesses that were described as gymnastic enterprises are impacted by digital transformations. 49 they still desire a stronger level of project management maturity, 49%. In other words, the journey is not yet complete. 
73% of gymnastic enterprise businesses have seen an increase in success rates for meeting project goals. Only 12% have deemed a project to be a failure. So we all, if those of us have been in project management for any amount of time, matter of fact, when I was very early on in my project management career, I was told um, by a, someone who already had several, uh, dec a couple of decades of project management, said the choice, uh, the difference between a good and a great project manager is choice of projects, right? Good project managers can deliver, great project managers know what projects to choose uh, so that they can, uh, you know, there, there are always some projects that you just are, are going to wrestle with. They don't have a lot of visibility, not a lot of support and things like that. That doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be a failure. Uh, failures are when, you know, we just pull the plug and say, we're going to walk away from this. This no longer makes sense for us to do. Of course, one of the um, case studies in that is something uh, you may have heard of is the, the Lidl, L-I-D-L, grocery store chain. Uh, their uh, implementation, seven-year journey with SAP that they canceled after investing 500 million euros into it. Um, there's some really interesting uh, insights into how that all occurred. Uh, but that is something where a lot was in, 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 you know, invested without a lot of return. Hopefully that doesn't describe your failure or your projects. But in, in light of that, unfortunately, I also have a lot of experience with being involved with PMOs that fail. Um, I have been working within PMOs, delivering projects on three different occasions where uh, management stepped in and said, we're going to disband the PMO. We don't think the PMO is adding value. That was the same uh, consistent message with each one. And I know that your PMOs are always being challenged to share what value are you providing. And so with this idea of the uh, gymnastic enterprise, switching our focus and transforming our mindset from here are the processes to follow to here are the outcomes we're trying to achieve. That is going to make what I believe all the difference in the world. And I see that with our clients as we do our consulting, uh, that that makes all the difference for them in helping to show the value the PMO provides, that we're being aiding and enabling that flexibility and an adaptation to the needs. Why do we need to adapt? Well, every situation or project that we come across, we can conceptually look at it as there's some level of uniqueness to it, right? Uh, uniqueness is inherent even within the definition of a project. Projects by definition are unique. There's also more or less experiences that we have to be able to deliver against that uniqueness. So less or more uniqueness, more or less experience. Where we have more experience and less uniqueness, we're gonna find operations. This is routine work, repeatable. We can uh, gauge ourselves on our efficiencies for this. If we have more uniqueness and less experience, it's gonna end in chaos, right? We don't know what to do. We don't know how to approach this. So why this is important to us is that as project managers, as PMOs, we're trying to drive into routine. Whatever situation or project uh, that we have, depending on the level of experience and the level of uniqueness, we have to be able to handle and manage that chaos until we move it into that routine and hand it off for our uh, operations people to be able to deliver effectively and efficiently over time and sustain. The closer we are to routine, we can do a plan-driven type of approach. In other words, the more predictability we have, we should be able to set out a very clear plan, manage according to that plan, and understand the target benefits and achieve those benefits in a very uh, systematic way. Wherever we have more chaos though, more uniqueness, less experience, we need to have a way to adapt. 
And so as a PMO, what we uh, advise is that you take a look at each one of your projects and you rate them in terms of the level of experience you have to deliver, as well as the uniqueness inherent within that project. And you just simply plot your projects on where they are in this, in this conceptual graph. Once you have that plotted, now we know that we have to have multiple ways of delivering because we have some projects where we're gonna to have to manage a level of chaos greater than others. This is what we call the value equation. Again, plan-driven, we have a pretty good idea of what we want and when we want it. So we simply establish requirements, design, build, test, deploy, and then gain the benefit or the value as it were. With adaptive, we don't know all we want or how we want to approach it, but we do know where to start. The fact that I can plot it on that uh, grid tells me we, can, we have a place we can start. So what we're going to do in that case is no matter what approach you use, we're gonna describe a minimal solution, validate that solution is effective, and then gain the benefit. Now the benefit we gain is likely gonna be much smaller than the benefit on the plan driven at the point in time in which it's delivered, but we will gain some benefit nonetheless. Likewise, then we take what we learned and we build another minimal solution validate, benefit, and so on and so forth. Now, when you look at this minimal solution, there's a couple of terms that maybe are being, uh, you, you may have come across, minimum, mar uh, minimal marketable product, uh, minimum viable product, uh, minimum business increment. All of these different terms are really describing the same thing and can be applied a little bit differently. But essentially, it's what's the smallest amount of value that you can uh, achieve and deliver in order to receive some benefit. So what I'm hoping that you see now is that that's where we measure the value. In fact, this changes our, our iron triangle of project management. Uh, traditionally, we look at a sponsor-driven approach, schedule, scope, and cost, trading those off, uh, making sure we have everything tied in with the sponsor, and instead, we're going to transition to what we call the value triangle. The value triangle is where we understand the value, and we're going to control the cost and the schedule in a way to ensure that the customer drives what we need for that value. This is what we mean by an agile triangle. Now, I want to stop right here and just mention one thing before we go too much further. When I use the term agile, I oftentimes people in their mind, they hear scrum, okay? Two week sprints and so on and so forth. I would like to ask you to expand your understanding of what agile is. Scrum is just one pattern that can be applied with an agile. If we're gonna be an agile enterprise, the way we deliver against that value and how we execute strategy is going to have to adapt to that situation. In that way, I'm using the term agile. So when we develop strategy, this is pretty fairly typical. And again, PMOs don't develop the strategy, but we are there to enable and execute the strategy. So typically we, you know, sector context, organizational context, cultural context, customer context. But what about value delivery context? What do we have as an organization in our toolbox in order to deliver it and adapt to the situation? And I'll provide you a couple of examples here in a bit, but which brings us to our project organizations. In the project organizations, we have our projects, our programs, and our portfolios. Typically, a PMO uh, can have characteristics of both a portfolio and a program, but just briefly, uh, just you know, typically or traditionally, senior management is going to set goals and objectives and set out initiatives based upon that strategy. There's a set of organizational resources that are available to deliver against that strategy. 
the portfolio is intended to take those initiatives and drive the priorities into those organizational resources so that the resources can deliver against those goals and objectives. In order to do that, we set up projects. Uh, projects that um, we may, again, map against those uh, uniqueness and uh, experiential uh, factors, but also we include operations to deliver against those objectives. And of course, there's cost uh, a significant, you know, annualized budget consideration here as well. Programs are intended to be when we have multiple projects that have common relationships, so we can manage the harmonization of that. Exper experiments and research, the business development, these oftentimes sit outside of the portfolio uh, because these are things that you don't know that any work is gonna come from them or any priority is gonna come from them necessarily. Uh, certainly if something does come, it will be then added to the portfolio. So this is the typical organization. What I'd like to do now is transition from the typical organization to a value-based project organization. But before we can do that, let's take a look at the value stream. When we talk about a value stream, a value stream begins and ends with a customer. The customer has a request and the request is fulfilled to the customer. So if I were to just use a very generalized value stream for an organization, there's a sales function, order is placed, payment is processed, is, the order is then fulfilled, and this is what we would call a very simplified, generalized value stream. When we talk about the delivery of value, there's two components. There's the value delivery, which is how we got there, the way in which we delivered that value. There's also value realization, which is ensuring the customer has the highest satisfaction in what they've received, but also how we can optimize how we're delivering for our own economic benefit as an organization. So let's take a look at from a project standpoint, we know that supporting that value stream, we have all kinds of different uh, methods and practices that might be able to be used. Lean, Agile, Scrum, DevOps, Idle, Disciplined Agile, Scaled Agile, uh, Less, uh, Scrum of Scrums, all kinds of different uh, methods and practices. However, where projects come in is let's say, for example, in fulfillment, we decide we want to swap out our warehouse inventory system. And in that warehouse inventory system, we're going to find that that's going to be quite disruptive to our organization. Anytime we swap out systems, there's going to be a disruption. The projects are there to help manage the, disru the uh, disruption, and that's why we have project management. The key to this is, does the customer really care that we're swapping out a warehouse inventory system? Of course not. The customer only cares that they receive the value. So in order to make sure we manage that disruption, we use plan-driven, adaptive uh, techniques, as well as, uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, incremental, iterative, and agile, as well as hybrid, which what might be a mix of adaptive and plan-driven, depending on the situation. As we do that, we draw from those practices that we see at the bottom. We can draw from the traditional, the lean, the scrum, the DevOps, or whatever the case may be. This is what we mean by being able to uh, be flexible and adaptive in the way that we deliver. So ultimately, in the project, it's going to come down to design, build, and deliver. So let's take another look at the value stream as it relates to IT delivery. Again, everything is going to begin and end with a customer. Not only do we have those different practices, but we have both projects, programs, as well as operations delivering those deliverables within the value stream. 
But let's take a look at what this might look like in terms of how we deliver value to our customers, most often internal. We get a set of requirements, we design, build, test, and deploy, and then maintain and sustain, right? So as you can see within IT, we have that same, uh, or I would say business process and uh, not just IT, not just the technical components, but delivering new features and functionality, regardless of what technique we're gonna use, we're going to follow the same conceptual path. Requirements, design, build, test, deploy. The primary difference between a lot of these different practices is the, how small the increment of work will be and whether or not we're gonna time box it or not. That's the primary difference. So now as we move to the value uh, driven type of uh, organization, project organization, if we take those value streams that we see with the order fulfillment and so on and so forth, and we begin to let the value stream owners set those goals, goal one and goal two, as the case may be, and then we allow the value stream owners to then drive the priorities through the portfolio so that the deliverables can then be delivered to those value stream owners. Now we have a value focused organization. Now there's a lot that goes into what really makes this work. But the primary thing is understanding the benefit that we're trying to achieve. There's other challenges within this as well. Everything from cross-organizational transparency, certainly you, uh, you, you feel this pain every day, everyone does. Uh, we have a relatively small organization. I still feel the pain of cross-organizational transparency. And that is because the way that work flows in an organization is different than the way we're organized. So if we always communicate up, across, and down, then it's going to be very difficult for us to harmonize within the value stream because oftentimes the value is delivered intersectionally across multiple areas irrespective of how the hierarchy is structured. Um, the, oftentimes also there's a, a barrier. We speak business terms or technology terms. Uh, we need to break down those barriers, right? And create cohesive teams as a result. And that's why bringing those value stream owners into the discussion at the portfolio level and letting them drive the priorities is so important. Also being able to see the big picture. How do we integrate decisions? How well do we align to the value the customer desires? Do we really understand what the customer wants? Security concerns, vulnerabilities, those sorts of things. We want uh, regulatory demands as well. And of course, what constitutes, if we're gonna break things down into small increments, what really constitutes a shippable product? How do we know that there's value there? How do we describe that? And ultimately, silos become inevitable. The reason for this is because, let's say, for example, we'll go back to our warehouse management system. When I were, if I were to deliver a warehouse management system for a manufacturing distribution company or something of that nature, there is oftentimes a significant amount of upfront work that is required to understand all of the configuration uh, scope for the system. How we're gonna transform this uh, into a new way of working. There's a lot of data conversion work that has to go on. Oftentimes that work is best done in more of a, you know, really understand 80-20 rule, Pareto's law, right? Uh, Pareto's rule where you want to understand 80% of those requirements before you start any work. Um, and so it tends to move us back into that silo of saying, well, the, the business analysts, they have that. The, the user representatives, let's just wait until they're done. And so it, it, there's always this kind of inertia to bring us back into silos, if, if it, as it were. Because you do, you do need to understand enough about the new system the configuration, the features, and those sorts of things 
to be able to establish a clear roadmap, that a product roadmap that you can deliver against. But there's also within the project as you deliver, there are little, you know, teams that are highly specialized that you need to bring to bear at certain points of time. Interface development, for example. The interfaces really can't be developed until you understand the configuration values and what the data objects are going to look like and those sorts of things. When you do need them, you need to bring them in and have them deliver very effectively and efficiently. What this does is it gives rise to this idea of hybrid, that there is multiple patterns of working within those hybrids. So what I'd like to do is uh, take a look as we go on into the next idea, which is to shift from prescription to pattern. So for example, if I were to do a where, replace a warehouse inventory management system, uh, there's a portion of the upfront work that I would want to include more traditional, that there would be a system requirements analysis, there would be a, a gap analysis in terms of what we want to try to bring over. It's really difficult to break that complexity down into small, little, minimal pieces. Now, there are a lot of people who argue with me on that. And, and I would say, be careful, because if you don't understand enough of the big picture, the roadmap is going to be incomplete. Now, especially those that uh, are in scaled agile, uh, that's why there's so much of the program and the architecture components of it uh, as well. But I would, I would not necessarily feel like I always had to have that overhead in order to just do what really in the delivery and in the, in the release train is Scrum. That, that's really what it is. There are other places like the interface development, you want them to be very efficient and effective that I would say the Kanban or the lean pattern would probably be more sufficient. Um, certainly DevOps and ex extreme programming. Uh, by the way, extreme programming is uh, something that really drives a lot of both the Kanban, Scrum, as well as ultimately safe and Scrum of Scrums and those sorts of things. That's really where uh, it came out of. Uh, but as a PMO, instead of prescribing, this is the way that we're going to work, think about what is the pattern I want to apply to this deliverable so that I can be most effective in delivering value to the customer. This is why I got so intrigued with Cyforma, because what I saw within the tool is the ability to manage within a single project multiple patterns of delivery with what the tool was capable of doing. And so from a project level, you get a holistic view of everything going on with the project without necessarily having to be prescriptive in one way of delivering that project. There may be other tools out there that, that show that, I haven't seen them. So let's take go back to our original uh, tailoring model or, or the, the five projects, as it were. And as we look at this, we can see that we have our five, one through five, and we've plotted that out in our chaos and routine graph, if you will. And I'm just going to take project three. That's something we've done over and over again. We feel very comfortable with it. We, just went, we need to manage it very closely. We're going to plan it out and manage according to the plan. It's something that we have... Uh, a lot of experience with. It's not that unique. Let's just go ahead and do that. For project one, for example, that is a little bit more adaptive, but maybe that's more like my warehouse inventory management system where we need to create multiple patterns within the project itself. For project two, that's way out there. Uh, it's as far out as we have right now in our we have less experience and more uniqueness involved. So we're going to pick from the different agile practices and methods in order to come up with the way that this will be run. Project four, uh, also agile, as we see here. And then project five, plan driven is fine. 
So now that we have this selection of the different types, we're ready to dip into our toolbox and find the right tool then to deliver for those projects. This is where the PMO can be of great help. In terms of aligning this with the PMO, as we saw with project one, we decided, you know what, Ex extreme programming, uh, project two, we're gonna uh, do more of uh, extreme program, I'm sorry, would be part of the hybrid that we described in project one. Project two, we feel comfortable in doing Scrum. Project three, we're just gonna run traditionally. Uh, project four, uh, we'll look at more of a, a lean Kanban sort of approach. And in project five, more traditional. What we can then establish, as we talked about with the value-based PMO organization, is set up value stream steering. So in other words, the steering is going to influence all of these projects, assuming that they fall within the same value stream ownership pattern. What the value stream steering can provide is strategy, priorities, resources, requirements. In turn, what they receive is the benefits and metrics, which then brings us to the PMO. The PMO can, can then facilitate with the projects, thinking about it from a program standpoint, everything from roles and responsibilities to how we're progressing, to the flow, to the organizational change, transformation that needs to go on, be able to manage requirements across multiple efforts, be able to track value realization, as well as governance. And we'll talk more about governance in our third session. Um, next week, we we're planning to talk more about these individual different methods. Or, I'm sorry, not next week, but in the second session in two weeks, uh, we'll talk more about the uh, different methods and practices that are involved. What the PMO does in terms of in interacting with the projects is they help organize the work items. In other words, we may have a program level backlog of major deliverables that need to be accomplished. And we may move those major deliverables across the different projects as, the, uh, as need be. This also can be based upon the uh, pattern that best fits the delivery for that. Two common themes that the PMO can provide is to ensure that there's a clear understanding of the benefit and that the higher the level of benefit, the higher the priority of the item. And so that facilitation is key in this area. Also, the PMO can provide architecture, guidance, training, and so on. In the meantime, the projects feed back to the program or the PMO, dependencies, feedback, and issues that can be facilitated with the steering as well. In this way, unless you have a very significant project going on, we don't need necessarily an individual steering committee by project. That the integration component is facilitated by the PMO, but the project management team then integrates that and aids in the communication across projects. So again, in our next session, we'll talk uh, more about that and how that would occur. So this, I don't know how much of this fundamentally changes your thinking about a PMO. Maybe some of you have already been looking at how to implement these sorts of things. But if you're struggling with uh, communicating and proving your value as a PMO, uh, it may be because the processes that you're looking to implement oftentimes are creating barriers as opposed to solving barriers. This is exactly what happened when uh, I've seen, like say three PMOs that I've worked with directly uh, that were disbanded, uh, all of which I was a PM within. Uh, matter of fact, in one of the uh, PMOs, <laughs> I was uh, pulled aside by one of the uh, 
directors, uh, basically lower level, uh, lower level executive manager within the organization, and said, you're about to go in a meeting where they're disbanding your organization. However, you know, and the reason is because the PMO is just not adding any value. Uh, it's getting in the way of work as opposed to facilitating work, and we're just going to disband it. However, we like what you do. And I got, I was like, that's kind of a weird statement because what I do is I do PM processes. Am I, I, but I never thought, oh, if I take this set of processes and apply them uniformly across every one of my efforts, that I should expect good results. I always looked at the situation and said, what would be the right tool for this job? But the two things we need are a clear understanding of the benefit. And the second thing is to shorten the feedback loop. As we shorten the feedback loop, we continue to roll through this and understand a little bit better uh, each time and iteratively become better. So I just encourage you to think of how are we going to approach this from a pattern perspective and learn how to apply these different patterns while at the same time growing our understanding of the benefit so that we can demonstrate that value to the organization. So with that, uh, that is the last slide I have for the discussion. I've got one more slide to close things out. Um, so with that, uh, Tim, I guess I would turn it back over to you. And do we have any questions out there that you would like to see some answers for? Thanks, Dan. Uh, let me get back on the video here. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, one is... Um, Okay, how do I convince my management to switch to value stream when they are still thinking in timelines, budgets, and scope? And do you have examples of organizations who did it? Yeah, so I can, uh, there are a couple of very good case studies out there of organizations that have uh, moved to value stream. Um, Ally Bank is one of those that um, it, it has has done that. Um, I, don't, I don't have any, what, what I would tell you is my clients that have, uh, started this transformation are experiencing the exact same pain uh, that you're expressing. Yeah. It, because it's, they're so, you know, there's a perception that if we just throw more process, mm -hmm. that everything will be, everything will be fine. Um, it's quite the opposite. So the best way I think to convince them is just show them the, the pulse of the profession and the stats in the, that are in there. It's quite a bit. The Pulse of Profession is out there on the PMI site, the 2021. I'm expecting they'll have the 2022 out fairly soon as well. There's a lot of good information there. Good. All right. Uh, another, uh, I guess, a comment or question. I think that's the key, the right tool for the job. Pick what works best for that particular project. That's correct. Now, one of the things that you may be realizing is if we're going to have this broad set of patterns that we can apply to any to whatever situation arises, that can get very expensive from a training standpoint. Um, when I say expensive, it's not money, it's time. Yeah, It's time to invest in people to show them how things are done, to work alongside them, and to pick up the different practices. So this gets into a, a much broader discussion about organic versus management-driven change, transformational change. Um, I see this a lot in organizations where the teams themselves are like, we really want to do Scrum. And so they're starting to do Scrum and management starts to feel this loss of control. And so they start being a little bit more directive than that is compatible with Scrum is we do want our self-organizing, self-directing teams there. And so we end up with this kind of standoff, if you will, between the, the work teams and management. Um, in, in terms of that, I think the PMO can step in and, and be of great value because not you may not see all of these different patterns within your organization. So being able to come in with at least a good view of what patterns are most consistently employed and then start there. Yeah. That's usually going to be about two or three. 
And that is something that as we work with our clients on transformation, we really, you know, we come in and we first look at the organization, how it delivers. And then we say, we actually have four or five or six patterns, but here's two or three that you can do more consistently. Okay. And you, as we like to say, you earn your way to speed and yeah. you earn your way to efficiency. Good. I have one other one, and, and before I read this one off, anybody has any other questions, pop them on the Q&A site, if you would. Uh, will you talk more in following sessions about how to track value realization? Yes. Uh, when we get to the third session, which is the governance, uh, that is where we track value realization. If we uh, Governance isn't whether or not we're following the processes. Uh, governance in this model is whether or not we're achieving the value that we set out to achieve. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Nice tease for the third one, Dan. That a boy. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them coming back, right? Uh, that's all the questions we have right now, unless anybody else wants to pop in there with a question. Uh, but otherwise, I'll let you wrap it up, Dan. All right. So with that, as a authorized training partner with PMI, uh, we do uh, have a PDO, a PDU code um, here. If you want to take this code down, I'm sure this uh, will be could be made available afterwards as well. Uh, the the code is still being processed at PMI, so give it a couple of days. Uh, but if you do want to claim your uh, PDU for this, you can use this code five zero zero five FZC four. O2. And you can claim your, your professional development unit, which uh, hopefully that will also be a tease for the next session. There so you I'll, go. <laughs> I'll have a different code for that session. Must be there to get it, right? <laughs> Must be there to get it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, that's it for today. Thanks, everybody. Unless there's any question coming in late, but I don't see one. So, uh, Dan, we appreciate it, and uh, we certainly appreciate everybody's attention and attendance, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you in two weeks on the 8th of September for the second uh, session of our four-session series here. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all.